When I made my video about paying off my house, there was some comments in the in the comment section saying, well, six years later, do you regret it? Do you regret paying off your house early? And in this video, I'm gonna talk about, I'm talk about some things you've probably never heard of and the reasons why I came to my conclusion. I feel like there's a lot of people out there giving a lot of half truths and like not everybody really knows why they are saying that. I have always been very adamant about documenting my entire process here on this channel, both financially, adventures, life in general, and even being a dad. In this video, I'm going to talk about it. I've talked about it multiple times on this channel, but I just want to give it one more straight shot to just kind of give you my opinions on the journey and what I learned. So that's what this video is going to be about. It's going to be about from zero to millionaire, what did I learn and what did paying off my house have to do with it? And let's get right to it. I want you to realize right off the bat that a lot of the information you get on the internet is geared towards a certain person, populace, idea. And that's really what you get with a lot of the financial information you get. One, more people out there are taking out mortgages than are paying off houses. So when you think about that, you're like, well, when you build content, you want it to appeal to masses and you want to tell them, hey, you've got a mortgage, keep your mortgage. And the bankers can keep selling mortgages. I mean, there'll be those comments out there like, hey, why would you pay off, pay off your mortgage at two, three, and 4% when you can put it in the market at 8%? And that goes into my very first reason of why I say what I say on all my videos is you forgot to factor in the delta of risk. You forgot to factor in that sometimes it doesn't go up 8%. Sometimes it goes down for two or three years. Or sometimes it stays stagnant. Or you don't know when the market's just not going to do what it says it's going to do or has said in the past. Because we're all charting this off the past. We don't know what taxes are going to be in the future. We don't know what inflation is going to be. There's a lot of factors in that equation that said... It's a fallacy to think that I can take financial advice and play it off what's the past and hoping I'm gonna get 8% in the future. I mean, honestly, you'll find out that if you really followed the waterline of the S&P 500, over the last few years, a lot of it's just been inflation. And the same way with the real estate market. A big key to this is a lot think that I can just go do something else with the money. Well, most people don't know what else to do with the money. They don't know where to put it. They don't know how to invest it in some type of vehicle that'll get, him that, get that return that they think they're going to get. So they wind up just like either doing nothing or just blowing it or just spending it. And that's why I like Dave Ramsey has come up with these rules over the years to just kind of simplify stuff because really the more complex you make it, the harder it is. The idea is to keep it simple and then just focus on upping your income and never change, never chase a trickle and leave your first source of income. And that's what a lot of people wind up doing. And I realize that's what he's, what he's saying. Because I've been looking through the comments on some of, uh, some of the people on the, the post I made on Facebook. And they're all like, well, I can do this and get this amount. Most people don't even know what to do to get that return. And they wind up just piddling the money away. At least Dave Ramsey says if it's in your house, it's not going anywhere. You actually got a return. You knew the return you were going to get, and you did it. Look, all these guys that are the smartest guy in the room, they would have all gone bankrupt. These guys carrying all this leverage, talking about all this leverage. They would have gone bankrupt in 2022, 2023, during the you-know-what, when the government stepped in and the Fed stepped in, they printed a ton of money, and they propped everybody up. All these guys would have gone bankrupt. All these guys, all these leveraged houses, all these guys, all these leveraged commercial buildings would have gone bankrupt. As long as well with all the other people would have been in bread lines and they would have lost everything they had because they're going to lose their jobs. They closed down the entire economy. It went to zero. In most places, no production. Shutting down the entire infrastructure, going to zero, and still saying that these companies were solvent. They weren't. The federal government and the politicians propped it all up. They said you didn't have to pay your mortgage. They said you didn't have to pay your student loans. And they sent stimulus checks. So don't tell me that leverage is a good idea because it will wipe them all out during that time period. So that's the first fallacy I believe in. I don't think you can compare a paid off house versus 
some historical data of the S&P 500 and getting 8%. When you pay down your mortgage, you know you're getting a known rate of return. For me, my first mortgage was 4.75. I knew by paying down my mortgage and paying it off, I was getting a return of 4.75. And at that time, I knew that I was getting a better return than the CDs I'd be getting in the bank or any other low risk investment that I could be making. And at the time I paid off my house, the stock market really wasn't doing much. The second one was homestead exemption. In many states, especially in the state of Florida, it, when you pay off your home, the money that you put in your home, it's safe, usually from creditors and litigation. The homestead laws in Florida are beautiful and they can protect properties up to a certain amount and I'll put them like here. There's certain size limits, etc. But I know the money that I put in the floorboards and the walls and the sheetrock, everything I invest in my home is going to be safe for most creditors. And that's a beautiful thing in the state of Florida. Check your own state for your own rules. But that was the first thing that as somebody that is so prone being on the internet and being a business owner and being in real estate, there's always that chance you can get sued. You gotta protect your money and the things you have through the homestead laws. And that's why a lot of really rich people do that. They take a large sum, they put it in a homestead, and as their sum of wealth gets bigger, usually so does their homestead. They go from a quarter acre to 10 acres, they go from a small house to a big house. And that money is illiquid and it's safe inside the homestead. We have homestead exemption here in the state of Florida, which allows you to pay less taxes on your home. And it, and it really drives home the po point of people wanting to buy and own property in a state like Florida. Everything I'm telling you in this video is something you're not gonna hear on the internet. You're not gonna hear from people that, are, except for those in the small back rooms that actually do this because they either don't know, the people you're getting the advice from are not wealthy and they just don't know. It took me a long time to understand how to set up the bedrock of financial independence. That's another reason about paying off your house, you're hedging yourself from inflation by owning a good solid piece of real estate. You're taking liquid cash and you're putting it in the dirt. Look, I got hacked. Me and Samantha got our bank accounts hacked, okay? I mean, Samantha's bank account got completely liquidated by somebody on the internet. And when we went through the whole process of the banks, Navy Federal, all these people, um, we had a real hard time convincing them about the security of our bank accounts. We had a hard time getting our money back. We had to fight for the money to get back. I made an entire video on that. Go check it out. But when you have a large sum of money in the bank, let's say a million bucks, which you should probably never have a million bucks in one bank, you need to stay within the FDIC limits for one, whether it's 250 or 500 married. You know, I split it all up and throw it to the wind. If you have any banks connected to the internet, they better not have a lot of money in it. And I've had a lot of very wealthy clients and they will say, hey man, well, you don't put a million bucks in the bank or five million bucks in the bank. Buy a piece of real estate, put your cash in it, pay for it, and it's pretty much protected except for the actual idea of it burning down and blowing away and somebody messing it up. But if, if the house stayed as it was, it would be safe in that piece of real estate hedged from inflation and going up. I believe inflation is going to continue in the few, next few years as of this date right here. And you need a hedge, whether it's in real estate as in vacant land or it's in real estate as in um, houses. Until the government fixes all the problems that are going on, you have to hold assets. And holding a piece of real estate paid for is one of the best ones there are. Look, I know lots of friends that have 10, 15, 20, 30 houses. And every one of them will mumble under their breath, I wish I just had 15 or so paid for. One, insurance, you can't control it if you have a mortgage and you got to have it. And if you don't have it, they will force place it. And then all of a sudden your cash flow is gone because the expenses have gone through the roof. These are things you just got to understand. And all these leverage guys out there had a lot of buddies that had 30 houses leveraged. And when their insurance tripled, 
their cash flow was gone. They were actually at a negative on most of these properties. And then we're having that problem here in the state of Florida with the insurance, especially second houses, third houses, fourth houses. Um, they're just, the insurance is going nuts. And uh, that, that it's just something nobody really wants to talk about, it, but it's a real thing. I'm a big proponent of just this. Don't carry debt. Debtor is slave to the lender. I just wanted to make this video for those out there that are in this I don't know situation. And that's the way I was. And through my struggle and journey, because six years ago, the YouTube isn't, wasn't what it is today. And there wasn't this idea. I asked financial advisors, I asked lawyers, I asked everybody, in me, everybody around me, like, what should I do right now? Should I pay off my house? And after six years, I'm telling you, pay off your house. It is not the worst idea you could ever do. And in fact, for me, it was one of the best ideas that ever happened to me. It reduced my stress level. It made me feel like um, I always had a place to come home to. It made my wife feel like if she lost her job tomorrow, we're okay until we figure it out. And that is huge. It is huge. I think Dave Ramsey was totally right. Because you have to build a financially stable platform to build your family on. And I feel like there's a few things in life you have to have, right? You have to have a house and a place to sleep. You gotta have, have a car. You know, you gotta have um, tangible items for your life. So after you get past a certain level and you've filled the void of the things that you, you need in life, then you can get wealthy, right? You're, you're building a life from the position of F you. If I don't like it, F you, I go home. My house is paid for. If you treat me wrong, I'm out of here. If you do me wrong, or you, you make fun of me, or you, you, you hurt my wife's feelings at work because you're a bad boss, I tell her, come home. You ain't got to have that. We'll figure it out. Got no bills. When your level of expenditures is so low and you make a lot of money, the track to get wealthy is really quick, okay? If you have $1,000 a month or $1,500, if you have $1,500 a month in expenditures between cars and food and everything, or $2,000, let's say $2,000, and you make twenty, dollars doesn't take long to get rich. I'm talking about a month now. Let's say you make $300,000 a year as a couple and your bills are $25,000 a year because everything's paid for. Don't take long to get rich. And that's what Dave Ramsey was trying to say. You up your income, you reduce your expenses. You can go eat anywhere you want to go. You can do anything you want to do. Go on any trip you want. And then the rest just gets shoveled into investments. You keep making it, investments. You keep making it, invest in your business. All these things you do from a position of stability. And that's what I want to talk about in this video. And that's what I'm trying to talk about in this video. That's how you get wealthy. Not through your spreadsheets of shaving a percent here or a percent there. You do it through building a solid core of finance and then you just funnel all the money into interest bearing accounts, your business, your, 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 yourself, growing yourself, being smarter, in better shape, eating better food, being around better people, getting, a, getting away from the bad places in life that could get you in trouble or drag you down. These are the things that make you wealthier. And so, no, I do not feel bad about not having a mortgage. People look at me all, all the time like, you don't have a mortgage? What do you mean you don't have a mortgage? What do you mean you've never had a mortgage on any of your properties? No, I haven't. And the cash flow was great. And the, the, the risk mitigation, you know, the thing about real estate people, they have a high tolerance for risk. I guess you could say I do. But I decide to mitigate all the risks down as much as possible. Because why take more risk than, that, than I have to? And uh, it's worked very well so far. That's how you get wealthy. One of the biggest, biggest misnomers of people thinking... This, this whole thing of four versus eight percent in the stock market and I'm gonna, the aggregate, uh, I'm going to keep. Well, that's not how you get rich, man. This, uh, this saving one percent here and splitting the difference two percent here is not how you gain wealth. You gain wealth by increasing your income, 
investing in good things, hedging yourself from inflation, having liquidity when the opportunity arrives, having a good idea and leveraging it, right? Like having social media and a big following and selling real estate, you've got leverage and you've got a high dollar item. Like these are the ways you get wealthy, not by splitting the difference between 2% and 4% in the stock market. Let me tell you something, between taxes, inflation, just churn, broker's fees, all these things you're going paying the taxes on all these 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 churning of stocks like can get to be a pain in the butt. Just like trying to do recapture on a real estate investment when you sell it. Look, Recapture is a crazy thing in real estate, and uh, for those of you that aren't tracking, when you go to do your taxes and you have a, you've been depreciating out a piece of property for many years, and you got to pay that recapture. It's the same way on all these people thinking they're going to write off all these F350s, and the recapture hits them when they go to sell it two, three years from now. This is just not something you just look on a spreadsheet and say. We're gonna do this. We're gonna we're gonna not pay down our mortgage, and we're gonna put it in the stock market, and we don't know what the risk of it. But we saw somebody on TikTok say it. It's just not how wealth is is grown. You are, you increasingly up your income. You carry zero debt. You take that high income, you put it in S and P 500, or you put it in a piece of real estate, or you put it in to something that grows, or you just grow the business. Just grow the business. Grow the business. That's how you get wealthy. Not by watching the TikTok on, on how do I pay off my mortgage faster. You pay off your mortgage faster by paying off your mortgage. Like that's how you do it. Make a lot of money, pay down your debt. You never carry more than 50% leverage on anything, okay? And even if you, you're getting, don't carry any leverage unless you absolutely have to. Use the leverage when that one big opportunity comes along and, and you're going to get wealthy. Don't carry a bunch of leverage on some stupid stuff. All you got to do, you're one insurance letter away from it tripling because of the roof getting old or the plumbing being different or just because an insurance company doesn't want to hold some coverage in that area anymore from a catastrophe. And I told you in many of these videos, and this is true, when my buddy's insurance was like 10 houses down from me, went from $1,000 a year to $15,000 a year. They forced placed the insurance and he got a letter one day that his insurance was going to go to $15,000 a year and it was going to be escrowed every month. So his fixed mortgage, his fixed what he thought he was going to be paying his eight or $900 a month for his house, went up a ton. And that's how this stuff happens. Now, if he didn't have any debt, he'd just be like, you know what, I just won't pay it. Well, I'll fix it, and uh, when I get it all fixed, I'll go get another insurance policy. But you're not going to foreclose on me, or you're not going to force place me. I'm going to tell that insurance company to pound sand until I figure it out. Or I don't. Pay down known rate returns. Don't take crazy risk. The risks that you cannot define is not known in the future, and you're betting on historical data. Good place to sleep is always a great investment. I don't care how you look at it on your little spreadsheets. You gotta have a place to sleep. You gotta have peace of mind. You gotta have a roof over your family's head, or it's gonna be a really hard life. Renters get kicked out when the when the landlord decides to sell or remodel or whatever. And if you're not moving all the time in your career, well, you need to own some real estate. It just is what it is, and. If you're bouncing around every two years, well, maybe not, because I did that in the military, and it allowed me to get to where I, I was at financially. But I was bouncing around. I was not in a place to take care of a piece of property. But if you're going to stay someplace for a while, four or five years, I saw a lot of my friends lose out on the ability to catch the greatest real estate run in probably history that we'll ever see, because they thought the housing market was going to crash. I've talked about that opinion on many videos, and now it's... It's unaffordable for them. They, it, the real estate market left them. Kind of like when the stock market explodes like it did in the last two or three years and people weren't invested. And you might be saying, well, what if I need the cash? Well, I mean, honestly, if you really, if you had to pay for a house and you needed the cash, you could just finance it. Just pull the money out. You do a HELOC, whatever. 
I'm not saying do that. I'm not saying go do that. I'm just saying if you had to, don't listen to that nonsense. Um, but you keep the money in the place you sleep. So that really pulls me into my next one is the peace of mind formula. One, um, you have a known place that you're going to sleep and build your empire back when the world crumbles. When you lose your job, when you have a, 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 a life crisis and you want to change your job, having a paid for house and low bills is amazing. That fortress of peace of mind, I always tell everybody the peace of mind formula. What it is to you and then go from there. Um, so like I said before, people that are super prone, if you're a business owner, a doctor or whatever, um, or your business could go south by one law being changed, you realize real fast, hey, I want a paid for house. And I tell all my entrepreneur friends, hey, you need a paid for house. And you know, the, the misnomer is this, they'll say, oh, a house is a liability. No, th there's a misnomer in that. And that misnomer is that you bought too much house. There's a price point of a house that is built for the bank, okay? Unless you're truly wealthy, those you know million dollar houses are, are built for the bank. They are a note sold by the bank to people and then they overbuy uh, on a house and their taxes, insurance, and mortgage is through the roof and they can never recover from it. It's called the golden handcuffs. They will work that job forever to pay for a very big house and uh, they don't have any investable income investable income. My net worth exploded after I paid for my house because I remember for, for the, the day after I paid for it, I could breathe. I knew from that day forward, I had a place to sleep no matter what happened. My family be taken care of no matter what happened. And it was one of the best things I ever did. Because when I bought my house, I paid, you know, $67,000 for it. Um, I bought a house that I could put some equity in if I fix it up through sweat equity, and I did, and it tripled. <laughs> I mean, like, like right off the bat, it had doubled just by me fixing it up, and I was able to ma magnify my net worth fast by real estate, and I did it over and over again with other pieces of real estate, but real estate tended to be my best approach to uh, getting more out of my dollars. And so I found a property in a great location that I knew if I fixed up, I would get a really good return on it. And then I paid it off. My mortgage was 4.75 on, I mean, it was only on like $55,000, but it allowed me to take the rest of the money I had because I didn't buy too big of a house. I could have bought a bigger house. I didn't buy too big of a house. I took that extra money and I bought other houses and I invested in my business and I invested in my personal growth. I invested in the S&M 500 as Alex Harmuzi would say. Because after I paid off my house, every dollar I made over expenditures that I had in my life went straight to investing. I started investing aggressively. I didn't have to worry about losing the house or losing my shirt. I had a position to push forward in and, and lean forward in the foxhole in every decision I made in investing. I didn't have to worry about making the mortgage payment or losing the mortgage payment. I just got very aggressive from then on and it allowed me to make some deals that I would have never made before. And then like 90% of my income was going to investing. And then my income became part of investing and it took me to a whole different level. And I'm so happy that I paid off my mortgage. Without a doubt, I don't want the money back. I don't need to refinance. My lender friends contact me all the time about refinancing my house. And I'm like, no, I don't need the money. I don't need it. I don't care about it. Like I'm fine right where I'm at. And the idea too is what I was saying about the peace of mind and it being illiquid was all that money was just sitting in the bank. And as Samantha learned the hard way, it can go away. Um, we could have any one of these bank failures that happen. It's like SVB and some of the other ones that are teetering. And I think we probably, all, uh, on a nightly basis, there's a lot of secret um, bank meetings that happen that could people could wake up and a lot of money is gone and it would take a long time to get it back. Look, when you get hacked or there's a financial meltdown, you just don't have access to that money for a very long time. And if all your money is in one bank, you don't have access to that money for a very long time. If you get 
litigated against. They freeze your assets. The IRS just erroneously came after you one day and froze your assets. If your business got frozen, if any of these things, or you woke up and you just didn't have a job tomorrow, I had a friend that that happened to him. was a very high-ranking director, and he showed up to one day he showed up to work one day and they said, let me have your badge. You can no longer go to your desk. I need you to leave the building. And they fired him that day. Been there 30 something years. He had a very big house, two fancy cars, and no job that was supporting all of that. And within three days, he went from high level exec to two payments missing, foreclosure on his house, and his whole way of life could have been gone just like that. And for those people that buy properties and they're not liquid enough to fix the things on the property when they go bad, they find themselves in the exact same situation. And that really goes into my last real section on this is the safety. If you don't have financial safety, if you can't build wealth to the point where your, your income through, through passive measures can sustain your life, you're gonna have a real hard time going into retirement. I talk to clients all the time, they're wanting to downsize, they're living on social security and a small pension, and they, they, they can't afford to hold a mortgage into retirement. Their income is smaller, they, they don't have the ability to work like they did, and the safety in retirement is huge. Now let me tell you this, when my dad got sick, when the hospital comes after you and your loved ones because of bills and they start leaning things and uh, they throw a judgment against you, that money in the bank is not safe. And it goes back to the homestead laws here in Florida. When my dad passed away and he got sick leading up to that, his medical bills was over a million dollars. I mean, it was a lot. And my mom was staring down the barrel of the hospital and, and, the, and the payments could take everything. All, all the money they had left, the, all the land, everything. And she, all she would have had when the dust settled was the house paid for and the land around it. Um, if it wasn't for the VA picking up the medical bills, they would have taken all of her money, everything left. And this is something you really got to plan for and you really got to think about this stuff hard. And I've lectured a lot of my friends about this. You got to prepare for it. And this is not something you just think you're gonna do at the last minute and uh, be, be safe. You gotta, you gotta forward plan this. And she, without a doubt, is happy that she always had a paid for house. If it's in your home, you're gonna keep it against creditors. Now, when you pass, there might be a lien on it. Depends on what state you're in. This is not financial advice, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just telling you the way I think about it. You're gonna keep that house while you're alive and they're not gonna take it from you for the most part. That is huge. If it's in the bank, not, not as safe. If it's in a stock, not as safe. If it's an S&P 500 and a brokerage account, not as safe. You gotta think about the safety as you get older and, and know how these things work. The banker is not gonna tell you that because he wants to hold your money. The financial advisor is not gonna tell you that because he wants to churn your money. The real estate agent, well, he's gonna wanna sell the house. I know I'm a real estate agent, but I'm just giving it to you straight here. That's somebody that's bills paid and just trying to make sure you're taken care of. You gotta really think about your safety in retirement. And these are the things that people don't tell you, but the rich really know, and they're not gonna say it. And the people that are saying they're rich don't know it. Because you gotta get to a certain wealth to know these things. And in every stage of wealth, you learn a different set of things that gets you to the next level. And these are these things, and I'm just trying to let you know. So comment down below if I missed something. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the next video.